The last engagement of the War of Italian Independence took place in 1859, and it was a bloody one. The Battle of Soferino led to almost 30,000 men killed and about 10,000 missing or imprisoned. Though you might hope that the countless wounded might in some way have medical care, this just wasn't really the case. The French army had more veterinarians than actual doctors, transportation was non-existent, and the bandages had been left behind. Not sure whose bright idea it was, but the 40,000 wounded were essentially left to fend for themselves with little food and water. Things were bleak and the suffering was great. But out of great tragedy can come great innovations to ensure that this doesn't happen again. And the Battle of Soferino was no exception. It's how Henry Durant had the idea for the Red Cross. He later won the first ever Nobel Peace Prize for it. You'd think that with such harrowing inspiration that the Red Cross would be eager to help everyone and to change the world, but it isn't necessarily the case. Even though the Red Cross claims to be secular and provide relief for all, religious diversity is a huge source of inevitable tension among the international organization. With the founders roots in Christianity, observers in Muslim states have felt left out of the founding of humanistic movements while others argue that the International Committee of the Red Cross and its movements aren't active in the name of any God, but humanity as a whole. Despite the debates, the organization was eventually brought to the US and has been around so long that they've become synonymous with disaster relief. It's what they do. And you'd think that with such a lengthy history involved in helping others through floods, hurricanes, and other tragedies, the Red Cross would be the best of the best at their jobs, but they're not. Instead, in the past few decades in particular, the Red Cross has proven that they're great at raising money, but horrible at knowing what to do with it. Take September 11th, for example. After the terrorist attacks in 2001, they raised over $1 billion for relief. They spent more than anyone on disaster relief, which given how much revenue that is, should come as no surprise. However, when you take a look at the amount they distributed, it gets a little disturbing. And that's right they only distributed 154 million out of that $1 billion. Now, to be fair, a massive portion of that money, about 564 million went to the Liberty Fund, but it was this fund itself that massively damaged the Red Cross in the eyes of the public. You see, the Liberty Fund was set up without any consultation from the board by CEO, Dr. Bernadine Healy, and was supposed to offer cash payouts to the families of the deceased, about $20,000 each. Instead, what happened was once they met their goals, the Red Cross said that they'd now put the rest of the money in a reserve for potential future terrorist attacks. To say that this pissed people off would be just a bit of an understatement. Critics and lawmakers alike were outraged, saying that the Red Cross had misled donors as to where their money was going and to do the right thing after such a huge heart-wrenching tragedy. I mean, this was so much more than a bad look. And in hindsight, I'm almost surprised that this didn't destroy them. The criticism got so bad that Red Cross even offered refunds and promised that they'd use at least half of the funds on services and cash funds to the families, as well as announce their plans for the rest of the money by January, 2002. Chairman of the Red Cross's board of directors, David McLaughlin said in a news conference, quote, "'The people of this country have given the Red Cross their hard earned dollars, their trust, and very clear direction for our September 11th relief efforts. Regrettably, it took us too long to hear their message. Now we must change course to restore the faith of our donors and the trust of Americans. And frankly, I don't know why it took them so long to hear the message. I thought it was pretty clear. What else did the Red Cross possibly think that Americans wanted the money to go towards? Their financial reserves, like seriously? It felt insensitive that the organization, as well as known and well-funded as they are, took hundreds of millions and said, we'll just save this for the next one. Like, what about the attack that literally just fucking happened? But this wasn't the first time the Red Cross found itself in hot water either. They were also accused of poor money management in other crisis situations, like the 1996 Oklahoma City bombing. There, they received $13 million in donation, but only dispersed a fraction of that money, about $2.6 million in Oklahoma City. The next year, their relief during the 1997 Red River Valley flooding came into question. In fact, their gross misuse of funds was bad enough that the Attorney General of Minnesota, Hubert H. Humphrey, called them out for not dispersing all of the donations they received for flood victims. And that's despite the fact that there were still victims in need of money to start recovering. Red Cross was just hanging on to that for victims of tomorrow, I guess. Unfortunately, it still gets worse than just holding on to funds. They've also lied about where donations have gone, proven that they care more about press coverage than relief. And their aid has literally been called worse than the storm when referring to the 2012 Hurricane Isaac. We have a lot to cover today. So buckle up because this really is a disaster. (laughs) 
Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about why the Red Cross absolutely does not deserve to be a household name in humanitarian relief. We're going to start with some of the things they're most well known for, such as their aid during hurricanes, earthquakes, and other natural disasters, and then we'll continue going worse and worse from there. Now, a few years after 9-11, Hurricane Katrina hit. The Red Cross reported that they provided 3.8 million overnight stays in shelters in 31 states, seven times higher than any other disaster up to that time. Not only was the storm unprecedented, but so was the help. They served a million meals in a single day and provided financial assistance to about 1.4 million families, 20 times more than they ever had before. The responses weren't ideal though, and state and local governments didn't act fast enough. Sufficient supplies, security, and evacuation procedures were lacking, and the government wasn't exactly proactive either. President Bush didn't ask for help with evacuations, assuming that city officials had a handle on it, and the Red Cross wasn't prepared either. According to the New York Times, they relied on inexperienced managers, their response was poorly planned, and they failed to meet the needs of victims. Apparently, Red Cross volunteers that drove out to neighborhoods were asked for water and juice, but they only had bleach on hand, and those that requested prepared meals got bananas instead. Some said they were impressed by the motivation and generosity of the volunteers, even if they just weren't prepared. International Red Cross reports said that while no criminal wrongdoing was done, the situation was handled so poorly that it bordered on such. Thomas Rees, a German logistics expert with the International Committee of the Red Cross wrote, quote, the insufficient control of deliveries allows without any effort to unlawfully appropriate and deviate material. Seriously, they had plenty of Barbie and Batman toys, radios without batteries, old Uno cards, and moldy pastries that they gave away, but no proper supplies from this very well-funded disaster relief charity? Now, here's the thing. If Red Cross had learned from this and resolved to find some more experienced managers and prepared their volunteers better, I may not be making this episode. Instead, Red Cross actually got worse as time went on. When the earthquake in Haiti struck, they had an opportunity to prove to the world that you could trust them with their dollars. And in late 2011, they launched LAMICA, the Creole acronym for a better life in my neighborhood. They intended on building around 700 homes by 2013 with finished floors, toilets, showers, and rainwater collection systems. People believed in the cause to the point about donating about half a billion dollars once again, proving how much trust they had in the Red Cross, but it was undeserved trust. They not only failed to build homes there, but left Haiti and the public without answers. All in all, there were only six permanent homes made by the Red Cross. This was some of the most successful fundraising ever, but in my opinion, I'd say this is some of the worst results. They had no experience, didn't spend millions within the Haitian communities like they promised their donors, and blamed these problems on red tape that they had to cross. I would absolutely love to gather up all their executives and hand them a tent or a tiny wooden frame tea shelter and tell them, hey, we just provided you with a new home. Who wants to bet they wouldn't be thanking you for that? A lot of money wasn't spent on Haitian people at all, interestingly enough, but on expatriates. Some of these expat workers were entitled to about $140,000 per year between their housing, home trips, relocation, and more, whereas Haitian engineers were allowed about 40,000 a year. Their word, commitments, and promises to the Haitian people were ultimately worthless. While I'm hesitant to say that they left Haitians worse off, If you're a charity of choice like Red Cross, people may give without thinking and just assume the money will get where it needs to go. So while those that wanted to help had donor fatigue, Haiti barely got that initial funding in the first place. It's pretty gross when the only answer you really have to the question, where did the money go, is who fucking knows? This entire mess has sort of become the poster child of why not to donate to the Red Cross, and understandably so. And instead of just making the same mistakes over and over and over again, they also managed to make brand new horrifying ones during Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Isaac. ProPublica investigated this charity's actions in 2012 and the findings are alarming to say the least. See, Red Cross knew that they needed good press and to improve their reputation. So what did they do? Well, their supervisors ordered trucks to be driven around nearly empty just to be seen. And I wish I was joking, but I'm not. One of these drivers, Jim Dunham, told ProPublica, quote, we were sent way down on the Gulf with nothing to give. Their relief effort was worse than the storm. I can't put into words how infuriating that is. I just truly can't. When an ambulance is nothing more than a backdrop, a fucking prop for their show, I have to wonder what's the point of them in the first place. Any supervisors and higher ups that took part in this are so delusional and have their heads so far up their own ass that they could probably see through their belly button. 
Not only did they prove that they didn't know the basics of care, but the Red Cross even had people in wheelchairs having to sleep in their chairs for days because they failed to secure the proper equipment for them. Oh, and they also had sex offenders in the children's play area in a shelter because they didn't know the proper procedures apparently. Hell, their definition of help is so terrible, it becomes one of those, if you don't laugh, you'll cry situations as they literally could not find people who needed food. So they threw away tens of thousands of meals instead. What's especially disheartening though, is that they still had support. Red Cross chief executive Gail McGovern called their relief efforts near flawless. And even President Obama and honorary chairman at the time told the public that the Red Cross knows what they're doing, but they didn't and they still don't. In 2016, Louisiana experienced horrific floods as one of the worst superstorms since Sandy arrived. Yet their shelters once again suffered from widespread mismanagement. At one shelter, a woman gave birth with no medical assistance. At another, there was no food or water for 24 hours. Red Cross workers showed up late to one, meaning that they only served 195 out of the 500 meals for that community. People were pretty much just dumped there and forgotten about, the nonprofit director Janet Rodas told ProPublica. I just happened to stop in and volunteer and I was appalled. State officials actually shut down the shelter after a week, cementing the charity status as one that loves to take, but fails to serve. They've botched so many natural disasters that it's more difficult to find an event that they truly helped where they actually aided the community as opposed to doing nothing or hurting people instead. And this is unfortunately what Red Cross is most infamous for, without a doubt. It's by no means the only controversy they've faced either. You probably know that the Red Cross offers training like CPR certification and lifeguard licenses, And as a former lifeguard myself, the latter really interested me as I've heard a lot about how the Red Cross operates in this way. The most recent example, of course, is their incredibly racist safety poster from 2016. It sure looked like the Red Cross was trying to show kids of all different races swimming together, labeling their behavior, but they just so happened to label the white children as cool and the black children or children of color as not cool. Did they seriously think to not run this by anybody? Ebony Rosemond, who runs an organization called Black Kids Swim, which is devoted to helping young black children become swimmers, said that the Red Cross needs to reevaluate the systems they have in place that allowed this to be released. It would be nice if they actually got the input of organizations such as this in the first place, but they're guilty of more than racism when it comes to pool safety. See, all the way back in the 1980s, the Red Cross had basically been the gold standard for lifeguard training. They'd been around since the 1910s after all. Yet in 1997, a new competitor named Ellis started making waves. If Red Cross had been so fantastic with such a great reputation, why did Ellis come along? Well, it's because Red Cross didn't deserve that title. Ellis and Associates focused on preventing people from drowning instead of reacting to someone already doing so. They require clients to buy three audits a year in which they have someone, maybe even Ellis himself, pretend to be drowning to ensure that they're meeting safety audits. And like I said, I'm a former lifeguard who is Ellison Associates certified. I was also Red Cross certified too. And I do know the difference between the two quite well. And if anyone listening also was an Ellis lifeguard, or maybe you still are, then you know what happens when it's audit day. It is a nightmare because they look just like any other patron in the park. And then all of a sudden they are going down and you have seconds. And then you know that there's a camera hidden somewhere on a tripod in a bush that is recording you so that they can evaluate your actions and how long to the second it took you to rescue them. And while that may sound stressful for someone who's not a lifeguard or hasn't been in the aquatics industry at all, I think it's absolutely amazing that that happens. And I think it's fantastic because every second counts when you're saving someone's life. It absolutely is. And according to the Wall Street Journal, Ellis trained lifeguards are also more alert because of undercover tests, leaving the company to overtake the Red Cross as the new gold standard pretty quickly. Disney World even dropped the Red Cross and hired Ellis instead in the late 1980s. And between my two trainings, when I think of the Red Cross training, it's more about like, hey, don't run on the pool deck. And "Mm, are they drowning? Not yet. Oh, shoot, now they're drowning. Where Ellis is more about, here's the preventative signs of what someone's gonna look like as they're about to drown. And it's far better to go jump into the water to rescue someone before they actually drown, even if it's a little embarrassing to them or yourself. But that's okay, because Ellis gives you the tools to understand someone who's about to be an active drowner and no one wants to experience the feeling or the sensation of having drowned. So if you have to deal with a little embarrassment that a lifeguard had to jump in because they noticed you were about to start drowning, so be it, I think it's safer. Now, unfortunately, I can't say the same about the Red Cross in all situations. 
And please note that I'm gonna go ahead and put a warning here that the rest of this chapter will be mentioning child death. So if you're not in the headspace to hear about that, feel free to skip the next couple of minutes, probably about four to five minutes. For the rest of us, let's continue. Now, personally, and this one's just my own experience as a former lifeguard, I've heard some horrible things about Red Cross and I've experienced some horrible things. And as a matter of fact, my previous Ellis training when I went to a Red Cross run facility actually helped me more than the supposed Red Cross training did. Here's something you're gonna find interesting, especially if you're not a lifeguard. There's essentially a rule of how many people are in a pool or are in like an aquatic facility to determine how many lifeguards have to be on stand. Now, Red Cross is fine with one lifeguard watching 50 kids and Ellis only allows one lifeguard to watch 20 kids at one time. From what I understood in this industry, Ellis came along because they were sick of the Red Cross basically letting kids die from being too reactionary. And during my trainings, there was this one VHS they made us watch that I'm pretty sure is called Touched by a Drowning. Like I'm 90% sure that's what it was. It's been brought up in r slash lifeguards before, and it's not really so much of a training video as it is a straight up documentary of how Red Cross lifeguards fucked up and let a nine-year-old boy, Norman, drown. The video interviews the lifeguards, but also shows exactly what they did wrong with footage of how they held him in a vice grip, not knowing how to backboard him or even extract him from the water. So they literally left Norman in the water face up until EMS arrived on scene. When I say that the footage of this child dying is disturbing, I mean, holy fuck, it's disturbing. I so rarely see anyone talk about it either. The way they handle natural disasters is messed up. And thankfully I didn't have a shortage of sources that discuss that topic, but seeming to find anyone mentioning how they were responsible for children drowning decades after their lifeguard certification was established, that's not talked about. And I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I have this innate awareness of the industry from working in it, but this is disturbing shit. It's a near impossible feat that you've got to scour the bowels of the internet for it, at least relatively speaking, this video is hard to come across, but thankfully, or perhaps unfortunately, I was able to find the original VHS tape uploaded to YouTube that showed this happening. And the footage is as upsetting as I remember. Throughout the footage, what stands out the most to me is the fact that there are multiple lifeguards standing there holding the child at the surface of the water and they are absolutely fucking clueless and they're not communicating well with each other either. When asked why they reacted in that way, they say that it's how they were trained and they didn't know what else to do. I could certainly expect this behavior from a civilian, but I genuinely don't believe that this should have happened from a certified lifeguard. And the thing is, I don't even fully blame these lifeguards, but the Red Cross for failing them so horribly. And this happened in 1999 too. So this is five years after they updated their program. It seems that that overhaul wasn't enough to save young Norman's life. The mayor where it happened, Eric Martin, summed up the situation pretty damn well in my opinion. And he said, If you're serious and you're responsible and you don't want to see a drowning, you should not let the Red Cross train your lifeguards. But we're still not done here, not yet, because these issues permeate just about every branch of Red Cross and everything they touch. And that includes their blood drives. Aside from natural disaster relief, the Red Cross is also known for its blood processing centers. At least the charity gets this right, providing blood to those who need it safely and securely, right? Well, no, this is the corporate casket where nothing is sacred. And yes, their blood centers have problems too. Back in late 2000, Dr. J. Epstein of the FDA wrote, the Red Cross blood operation is not in compliance with the current laws and regulations. The problems are serious because of the potential for harm it doesn't get much more black and white than that. In fact, these issues were so serious that the FDA said they believed the Red Cross wasn't in compliance with CGMP, current good manufacturing practice provisions since about 1985. I don't think I should have to explain why that's terrible, but for reference, the Red Cross provides around 40% of the nation's blood, almost half, but their organization as a whole doesn't align with CGMP provisions. I'm not shocked given what we already know, I'm just disappointed. At times, their violations included an improper release of blood product that tested positive for cytomegalovirus and not following procedures with blood that tested positive for the AIDS virus. The thing is, it's not as if the Red Cross didn't know about these things or didn't understand the expectations in place for them. They'd been under government supervision since 1993. In fact, the government gave them a decade to clean up their act before imposing tens of millions of dollars worth of fines. Worse still, the FDA couldn't even definitively say that there wasn't a danger in the blood supply due to the failure of safeguards. 
One safeguard failing may happen, but each time it does, the risk of unsafe products goes up. And obviously when the product is blood, this can be especially dangerous. Other examples of these issues include not utilizing look back investigations, meaning that some workers weren't tracking down blood from donors that had infections and notifying patients that received the blood. One phlebotomist inexplicably stuck herself with a needle and then directly stuck a patient with the same needle to draw blood. NBC states that no one reported the incident for a month. And again, these are just basic safety measures that the Red Cross has failed to follow. Yet while the Red Cross is questionable at upholding other people's standards, they sure seem keen on upholding their own discriminatory ones. Gay and bisexual men are told to abstain from sex for a minimum of three months before they can donate blood. The deferral time used to be one year, but that was shortened to 90 days in April, 2020, as blood donations dropped. According to the American Medical Association, the deferral period singles out and bans blood donors based on inherent attributes other than the risk factors they present. Quote, For example, a man who has protected sex with another man in the three months prior to a blood donation cannot be a donor, but a man or woman who has unprotected sex with multiple partners of the opposite sex over the same time period remains eligible. Not only is the Red Cross continuing discrimination surrounding blood donation that emerged from the HIV AIDS crisis of the 1980s, but this fails to evaluate donors equally. As an added bonus, because of course there's more to this, Red Cross workers blame the charity itself for the blood shortage declared in January, insisting that if they didn't have such low pay and understaffing, we may not be in this position. They press that it's not because people aren't donating, it's actually because they had to turn people away because of backed up lines. And yes, you heard me right. In a blood shortage, the Red Cross had to turn people away because they don't pay their workers enough while expecting grueling work from them. Now, none of this is to say that the Red Cross does no good whatsoever, as ultimately they do provide blood to people who need it. But at the end of the day, it's really the workers that we should be thanking, not the charity itself. Red Cross has had decades long violations, discriminatory bans, and treated essential workers so poorly that they're walking off the job. And unfortunately, it's Red Cross itself that we rely on so heavily. Typically, when an organization is this utterly useless and terrible at their job, I'd say let's burn the whole thing and start over. Not literally, but you get my meaning. However, we can't afford to lose 40% of our blood supply. And I'm pretty confident you can say that with or without a shortage. I don't want the Red Cross to be shut down. I just want us to be reliant on multiple reputable organizations. But unfortunately, because of how much we need the Red Cross, that brings us to a bit of a catch-22 situation. Director of Public Citizens Health Research Group, Dr. Sidney Wolf, has said that there's little evidence that the Red Cross is ever going to comply with the laws and regulations surrounding blood. While the logical step might be getting rid of the Red Cross, it doesn't seem like we can afford to leave them behind either. So where exactly does that leave us? And before we try to take a look at that final piece of the puzzle, I'm just gonna take a moment here to thank today's sponsors. It's the holidays and it's the most wonderful time of the year, but if you're a business owner and working in the online space, it's also one of the most hectic times of the year. And that's because everyone puts off shopping until the last minute. And if you have an online store, you know the feeling of getting hit with a ton of orders at once and absolutely losing it. How am I going to handle all of this? But while the holidays may strike up rough seas for some, you don't have to worry about that because ShipStation is here to help. ShipStation works with all of your favorite places that you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. It allows you to manage every order from one simple dashboard. You can automate routine shipping tasks, print your shipping labels, and easily compare rates and delivery times to optimize every shipment every time. No one wants to think too hard during the holidays. And luckily, ShipStation is a no-brainer. You'll save time, money, and stress during the holiday rush. And when you sign up using my promo code, you'll even get two months for free. Which speaking of that, Give yourself the gift of stress-free holiday shipping this year. Use promo code CASKET today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, promo code CASKET. And then after a long day of doing all that packaging or working or whatever you're doing in a day, then it's time to come home and cook dinner. And my God, is that a hassle now because you're just exhausted. Well, as your calendar is filling up this season, you can count on HelloFresh to get you some of your free time back by making cooking simple, easy, quick, and fun. With over 35 weekly recipes, there's something to please everyone. And with HelloFresh's quick and easy options like 20 minute meals and easy cleanup recipes, it allows you to enjoy good times around the dinner table with loved ones and less time in the kitchen. Busy days and late nights call for more flexibility. And that's why HelloFresh's plans work with your schedule. 
You can always change your preferences, delivery day, and address in just a few clicks. So if you're ready to have some delicious home-cooked meals this season, make sure you go to hellofresh.com casket70 and use code casket70 for 70% off plus free shipping. Again, that's hellofresh.com casket70 with code casket70 for 70% off plus free shipping. The fact of the matter is that the Red Cross isn't despicable for all the usual reasons. Yes, they do pay their executives quite a hefty wage with some of them getting about half a million dollars a year. But with this charity, it's not the executive pay or fundraising that I have a particular issue with. The Red Cross is a charity that people have come to depend on. Though they're not a government entity, they have a relationship with the feds and have the legal status of a federal instrumentality. Their reach, their influence, and their power is undeniable. They've become so powerful, in fact, that they've been sued over using their symbol on emergency aid products. For a century, there was an understanding between the Red Cross and Johnson & Johnson. J&J was for commercial retail and Red Cross was for humanitarian products. Simple as that. But in 2004, Red Cross started licensing the symbol to commercial partners, upsetting J&J. The Red Cross won out here, but it's clear how much sway they have when even Johnson & Johnson is considering them competition. Trusting in the Red Cross has literally become second thought for so many that after a tragedy strikes, you can just click on a donate button, give some money to the Red Cross and there you go, you've done your part. And truly, I wish that were the case, but their track record shows that the Red Cross doesn't even know what to do with the money they receive. And for the record, the examples I gave today were only some of their most infamous, but believe me, I could continue on for quite a while longer about the many, many list of disasters that they've mishandled. During the 2015 California wildfires, they shut down other volunteer operations, rebuffed residents trying to help and insisted that they could handle it by themselves. And by handle it, I mean turn away donated materials and supplies while giving just 25 of 1000 evacuees housing in an outdoor area, leaving the rest in tents and RVs. Oh, and I guess the money for the victims of tomorrow thing isn't enough for a sleeping pad as one mother unfortunately found out when she asked the Red Cross for one to help her disabled daughter be comfortable. They said no, by the way, and that she had to be one of the lucky few in an indoor shelter to have a cushion. And as of right now, the Ukrainian Red Cross is helping victims of the war, though there's been some controversy surrounding the ICRC or the International Committee of the Red Cross and their neutrality in recent months. Yes, the Red Cross can do great good. They're more than capable of it with their reach. It just doesn't seem like they even know what to do with all their funds. And instead of helping people in need, they've consistently been left scrambling. All I'm asking you to think of is next time a disaster happens, don't immediately and instinctively donate to the Red Cross. Look into other local organizations helping that region and support reputable organizations so they can actually grow. I do truly want Red Cross to live up to their potential, but at the moment, I can't say they ever have. But with all of that being said, that is going to be the end of today's episode. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I also wanna give a big thank you to all of my patrons over at patreon.com. You guys are some of the nicest folks I have ever, ever had the opportunity to talk to. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. I do truly appreciate it and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.